Gameplay is prime in video games. That's the most important part. And sometimes it's got to be really good because those cutscenes are oof. Hi folks, it's Falcon and today on GameRanks, 10 of the cringiest video game cutscenes of all time. Starting off at number 10, it's NBA 2K15. So if you've ever watched a bad movie, like where nobody knows what they're doing in terms of making a movie, then you know exactly what NBA 2K15, uh, its story mode, really just a lot of its dialogue and choices in terms of performance. You know what that's like, cause it's like that. Man, Man ugly doesn't even begin to describe what happened out there. Uh, what would you call it? Sorry, pathetic, garbage, embarrassing. Just gotta let it go. Get it back tomorrow, study some films, see what went wrong at the weight room, get some treatment, make it up next time. Calling the acting in this game bad or cringe is really understating what's going on here. It's one of those situations where I don't know whether they had bad actors or a limited amount of time or takes or whatever, but there's stuff I swear it sounds like Squanch Games type stuttering, like Rick Sanchez type stuttering and stuff. Man, I got more than anybody on this team. Anybody. For real? Yeah, it's like that. Do I look serious? Y'all can come see for yourselves. It's whatever. Bring it. Don't be scared. Yeah, I'm in the building now. That's what I thought. You have expecting to be drunk and burping and opening portals to other dimensions. Like there's really awkward interviews with players where they say weird stuff about like catching fire when the teammates leave them open. And I don't know what to make of it. I mean, there's some truly bizarre parts. Like these guys are talking in the locker room. There's moments in this where you can't really tell if anger is inappropriate because the other person is talking in a way where you just can't tell what the line is genuinely supposed to mean. Like, I'm pretty sure something was supposed to be sarcastic in this locker room scene because it gets the one player angry, but like, if it was said sincerely, it makes no sense. And it sounds sincere. Badly acted sincere, might I add, but it sounds sincere. The My Career Mode just starts off with a ton of unnecessary and insane sounding drama that neither of the actors are very good at conveying. There's my guy. Your guy? Your guy? Your guy was told by his agent that he was gonna be a late first round, maybe second round draft pick. Your guy's supposed to be in New York with the rest of those chumps. Your guy, your guy's about to blow his freaking lid because his dream of being in the NBA is still just a dream. Hey, chill, man. I know this isn't how we wanted it to go down. Believe me. Like I told you, you're my last best hope at the agency. If you wash out, I wash out with you. Your agent guy, I mean, he's blech at best. And you sound like you're just going to kill him. And you think you could. It seems like the size difference between these two men is pretty obvious. I don't know. Everything about it is just very strange. So the problem here was that they decided to have actual NBA players do the voice acting, which <laughs> was not the right decision. These guys are amazing on the court. They do stuff I could never dream of. It's extremely easy to admire the talent that professional basketball players have for playing basketball. There is no aspect of that that says these guys are going to be able to act and therefore you should bring them in as voice actors into a video game. Good. I'm glad you're here. Just remember, it's all out there for you. Work hard, listen, watch how we do. You got a chance to be something special. Now let's see what you got. The following year, they had Spike Lee do it. And I'll say this, the acting's a hundred million times better. That doesn't mean it's good, but if you compare it to this, it feels like you're watching an Oscar nominated performance. <laughs> At number nine is Dragon Age Origins, uh, Leliana's song. Bioware really elevated the medium of video games and storytelling with the writing for its games. <laughs> oh, but sometimes they were a little too ambitious. Like, I, I know this moment has defenders. I'm not going to claim that there is no one that likes it or at least recognizes its utility. But when I witnessed this, I wanted to crawl into a hole and die from the secondhand embarrassment. And, and that's a running theme you're going to notice in these. A lot of the 
cringe is the secondhand embarrassment kind of cringe. Okay, so I'm not talking about the DLC that's called Leliana's Song. I am talking about everyone gathering around the campfire for Leliana to sing a song, which is in the main game. It's two straight minutes of Leliana standing, her mouth opening and closing, basically not in sync with the song. And it's the basically the Dragon Age song. It isn't really a song. There aren't any lyrics. It's just gibberish. Um, it's not necessarily the song itself that's bad either, but the animation really, it really makes it feel like it goes on forever. It's all just stock conversation motions, uh, but set to a song and it, it just doesn't really match up. It doesn't help that it's already a pretty ugly game, even by the standards of the time. And the giant low poly cheese wheel in the background doesn't, doesn't do a whole lot to add to the gravitas of the situation. I have got nothing against a good song in a game. Uh, but this is not that. It's so awkward and very strange to sit through. I don't understand why they went with the theme either. Like, go with a song. Something we haven't heard a hundred times already. Like, it's the Dragon Age theme. At number eight is Final Fantasy XV's Cup Noodles. In-game advertising, pretty embarrassing in general. Like that Ubisoft game with the Samsung branding all over the place. That was weird. But the worst of it is kind of like just that. Some bad billboards or a real product or two around. But Final Fantasy XV really went hard with a Cup Noodles promotion. And in doing so, passing a cringe moment legend is an entire quest dedicated to Cup Noodles. And it is something else. I have never seen a game push such a hard sell of a product on you. First off, I love cup noodles. So don't think that I'm I'm taking a big old dump on cup noodles here. Cup noodles are fantastic. It's so easy to make. It's so tasty to eat. But when one of your party members stops the game and point blank asks what your favorite cup noodle is, it's weird, but it's, it keeps getting weird. He explains why the flavor is so good, how the company picks only the finest ingredients, how cup noodles are the perfect food that is so easy to make. And I'm like, what is happening? Any food you make tastes better when you use good ingredients, right? Then if you take something already delicious like cup noodles and add in the finest, freshest ingredients, what do you get? The ultimate flavor experience. Like he keeps going, literally like reading ad copy. It is absolutely absurd. Like if the game gave you the option to like punch him in the face, it would probably at least not feel like this, but it feels like this. Like you're forced to go along with this thing and basically agree with him just how great cup noodles are. Ah. After all, the shrimp they use in cup noodles was selected from over 60 varieties for their flavor and their shape. It's perfection. Press X to love cup noodles. All right. It's truly freaking bizarre. Like I said, I love cup noodles. I could sit here and I could tell you why I love cup noodles. They are salty, tasty goodness. Sure. But what I just said there in a sentence probably has more life in it than everything they try to jam down your throat with this. It is bizarre. There's no punchline at the end because why would they do that? They're just feeding you the worst ad they could possibly cook up in this situation. I, I don't know. It's one of the strangest things I've ever seen. That's all, that's all I can really say. All that's left is to make our noodle dream a reality. First up, the ingredients. Yeah, yeah, whatever you say. And number seven is the Stargazer from Mass Effect 3. The final coda of the full Mass Effect trilogy is this. Calling the conclusion of Mass Effect 3 divisive would be like, well, calling the cup noodle ad in Final Fantasy 16 kind of weird. Huge understatement. Uh, there are plenty of haters. There's it's plenty of defenders, but I don't really see anybody out there spending a lot of time talking about how great the Stargazer is. After mostly unsatisfying and vague conclusion of the game, the credits roll. You hit this scene where an old man calls somebody, my sweet. When can I go to the stars? One day, my sweet. And frankly, it just comes off as ah, not, not, not dude, this is weird. It's meant to be a button on the entire trilogy, but it comes off weird and wrong, especially after unsatisfying and weird the ending already is. The voice, by the way, comes from Buzz Aldrin, an actual astronaut, not a voice actor. Yes, deserves respect for the amazing accomplishments that he has had throughout his lifetime, but I don't know why they decided to make him the voice of this, because he does not voice it well. Our galaxy has billions of stars. Each of those stars 
could have many worlds. Like, I don't know if the dialogue could work, but it definitely doesn't work in the hands of somebody who doesn't voice act. It's all weird and dumb and frankly, just kind of bad. If the ending to Mass Effect 3 is maybe more traditionally positive or even dramatic, this maybe would have come off better, but as it stands, ooh, it is cringe. And number six is Heavy Rain. You're like, oh boy, what? Oh, where are we going with this? Because oh, there's a lot to choose from here. There's a lot of stuff that's that's very silly in this game, and not intentionally so. But hey, so you ever thought about the fact that a love scene in a video game is usually pretty weird? It is. The technology kind of isn't completely there to do all of the convincing body language, and, and I guess just not uncanny stuff. And that's like amazing games. Now, Heavy Rain, while it was technologically impressive for a lot of reasons at its time, uh, it is not now. David Cage, um, founder of Quantic Dream, uh, he loves a good, awkward, unprovoked love scene. The one in Heavy Rain is, ooh boy, it's a big jump up from uh, the Indigo Prophecy, but uh, it's not just good graphics that make it work, and it doesn't. And maybe it's even kind of worse because it's closer and then the uncanny stuff starts happening worse. And this is really hard to sit through. Uh, really hard to sit through. In chapter one, you're given the option not to do this. And yeah, good idea. Because if you decide to, you get to basically like, you get to kind of watch um, weird puppet sex ish. I hesitate to call it sex. It's not sex. It's sexual, but it feels about as real as when like somebody takes Barbie and Ken and mashes them together. It's uh, it's it's only a few minutes, but it really feels like it never ends. And you have to do QTEs, <laughs> which after my first playthrough, I have never chosen to do ever again. I'm talking about the feeling where like I, I, I don't think I've ever witnessed a murder, but I think that I would have a similar feeling. Like you kind of feel the outside of your body get both like very hot and very cold at the exact same time. And that weird contradicting outer shell feeling is accompanied with everything inside of you shrinking to about a tenth of its normal size. And you're just like, ah, no. And it's not like heavy rain only makes you feel this once, like the Madison scene in the club. It might, it could be more embarrassing than this one, depending on who you are. This game is a literal embarrassment of riches. At number five is Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core, the first ending. Now, don't come at me with your knives and pitchforks just yet. I'm not talking about the universally beloved climax of the game. I'm talking about the other ending, the one that actually resolves the conflict of the game. Like, everything about Genesis is cringe. He's the ultimate original character, do not steal, if it was made by the actual series creator. He's Sephiroth with a red jacket and an even more convoluted backstory. His dialogue is even more cryptic bullshit. He's actually better, more powerful, and more important than Sephiroth, the actual bad guy. He's also Gact, a Japanese pop star that... <sighs> I don't know. I don't know why he's here. The cringe comes from this guy's absurdly overwrought dialogue. For some reason, this guy is obsessed with the fictional play Loveless. And yes, if you are aware of Final Fantasy VII, you're aware that it plays into the lore to some extent, but this guy quotes it like it is some kind of religious text. I mean, he does say tons of stuff that just kind of cryptic and philosophical sounding, and he does kind of sound like a delusional idiot. So it kind of fits in with a lot of the other stuff he says, but hey, whatever. The goddess descends from the sky. Wings of light and dark spread afar. She guides us to bliss, her gift everlasting. The final scenes with this guy really dial it up, though. And the moment after you beat him is one of the most laughably bizarre and embarrassing moments I've ever seen in a game. I'm talking about the part where Zack, our beloved main character, makes his own soldier pile. Yeah, he's not hauling around just one unconscious body. He's got three at this point. After adding Genesis to the main pile, along with Angeo and Cloud, he proceeds to put apples in all their hands and says, Okay, 
Let's see. Like a total lunatic, like a serial killer. Like it literally seems like a calling card, except for obviously none of these guys are dead and he doesn't want to kill him. And he says, let's eat. What is this? It's so cringy. And then the actual ending happens and that's thankfully kind of just left alone forever. But I, but did, I mean, I still remember that part though. Did I need to, did I need to see that? Did we need it? Why did you do that? It's weird. It makes him very weird. And number four is the Saints Row reboot, meeting the roommates. Hey, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about without even saying anything. If you played that game, because uh, when people complain about jo jokey dialogue in games or in Marvel movies or whatever, this is what they mean. It's this quippy, fast talking, friendly discussions that nobody in real life sounds like. Zero people. And I know this because I've seen people try to do it in real life and it puts everyone else off. And then they don't do it again because they realize it doesn't work. Hey! <laughs> hey! The wage slave is back! How was your first day? Were the other mercenaries nice to you? You know, as far as hired killers go, I'd give them a seven. You look like you could use a mugmosa. Thanks, Eli. Seriously, how's the job? Eh, it's the murder business. The fundamentals don't change, just the uniform. Uh, I can tell you love it. <laughs> okay. I don't have to love it. I have to pay my student loans. <laughs> I'm in. With the recent closure of Volition, it feels a little like kicking somebody when they're down, like maybe not down, maybe actually dead. So I'm not going to belabor the point here too much. And Volition, when they were around, they were a great developer, man. The old Saints Row games, Red Faction, Guerrilla. I mean, go back to their early stuff, Descent. Like Descent is, in my opinion, just a huge jump over Doom. And it was only two years later. And then they decided to reboot Saints Row and it's literally just like this horrible sitcom in the Netflix era of sitcom writing where sitcoms are trying to recapture that old magic but have no freaking idea why anybody ever watched a sitcom so they all try to default to Big Bang Theory which is I, I, it's a really popular sitcom for some reason but wow do I not want that ever and it's supposed to be a Saints Row game at number three is Kingdom Hearts 2's Little Mermaid creatures. For a series as strange as Kingdom Hearts, there's not a lot of stuff you'd traditionally label cringe. Yeah, there's a lot of laughable stuff, um, like Goofy dying. I will never not laugh at that. I'm goofy. But not a lot of cringe. They kind of condensed all the cringy stuff into this singular cringe vortex, a black hole simply known as Atlantica. This whole part is so embarrassing that one of the main searches for it on Google is if you can skip it, which yes, you can. So they they knew, that's what I always assert. They knew that making this mandatory would probably get them indicted for war crimes to some, some extent. Uh, it's a musical, not a good one either. There are good ones, but this is a bad one. It's cute that they tried, but there are a few things more embarrassing than sitting through a bad song, and that's what you're gonna do here if you don't skip it. <laughs> you can do it! Don't be shy, let the music inside it. Dance, dance, dance. Skip it! You should skip it. Like, even if you like Disney musicals, and there's a lot of people who do that's completely valid. I enjoy a few of them. A few of them, I, I, I get a lesser version of the feeling I get from this. This is rough. The songs sound like they're for babies. And Kingdom Hearts, while it's definitely a Disney game, is for a slightly more mature mind than every Disney musical, and this is bad by Disney musical standards. Pure cringe. And number two is Mortal Kombat Mythologies, the first real cutscene. Uh, it's one of those cute that they tried things, but what is going on here? I guess it makes sense to follow up the digitized actors in the first few Mortal Kombat games with actual FMV movies, but uh, this is embarrassing. The absurd costumes, the over-the-top acting from basically everybody, especially Quan Chi, who just turns it all the way up to 11 in a place that is not helpful to do so. I am Lin Kuei. Scorpion was a ninja. Ah, uh, yes, your Japanese counterpart. How unfortunate that you happened upon him in your battle with those pesky Shaolin monks. Scorpion was tipped off. He knew I was breaking into that temple, and if he wasn't there, there wouldn't have been a battle. 
You are responsible for this sorcerer. It's all extremely amateurish in direction and camera work. It's, it's super cringe. Look at Sub-Zero's pose. Look at his pose. What is that? Why is arms so far apart? What is anyone here doing? Everyone looks crazy, especially the Lin Kwai master with his silly red outfit. There's no end of the things to complain about here. It is laughably lame, embarrassing to see. And finally, at number one, it's Mega Man X4's Iris death scene. I've already talked about the DMC one, where somebody shouts the heavens in a laughable fashion. I should have been the one to fill your dark soul with light! So here's the other big one. This has been memed to hell and back, and for good reason. When Zero picks up his robot girlfriend's body and shouts in the sky, you, can, you laugh. Iris! 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 There's nothing else to do. You can only laugh. If a little dialogue wheel popped up in real life, it wouldn't have options. It would be one of those ones where you're like, this is not a good dialogue wheel. Why even have it? I'm just gonna laugh. That's the only option. You just gotta hear this though. It's one of the worst line deliveries of all time. The part where his voice cracks and he suddenly sounds like Kermit the Frog, it's as far as cringe goes, chef's kiss. No, this isn't happening. There's no reason for me to go on. What? What am I fighting for? The majority of acting in Mega Man X4 is subpar to say the least, but this one specific cutscene, it's really an all time great cringe moment. There's not a lot to say about it. The, the context really barely matters though. It's just a ridiculous line presented in the most melodramatic possible way and it goes completely bust. I feel like there should have been a second take and if there was, this was the best one. To be frank, Mega Man X4 is one of my favorite of the Mega Man X's. I remember getting it on PlayStation and being like, yes, through like the whole game, except these cutscenes, particularly this one. But this is also Resident Evil 1 Capcom we're talking about. Voice acting was not exactly a priority at that time. I'll throw in a bonus for you. It's plumbers don't wear ties and it's gonna, it's gonna be another everything one. It's kind of for advanced cringe connoisseurs only. It's so bad and embarrassing that it barely even deserves to be mentioned, let alone remembered. It's an ill-fated 3DO game, which like the 3DO itself was pretty ill-fated. And games like this are why. It's meant to be an adult-oriented romantic comedy with full motion video. And if you're asking, what does that mean? Well, apparently a lot of grainy still images with some pretty amateurish voice acting layered over it. The adult-oriented part of it, oh, it makes it embarrassing. They try to draw people in with the promise of titillation, but it's a smokescreen for a game that would pretty much be considered shovelware today. It got a physical release though. It's got a box and everything. It's one of those games that just has to be seen. There's no way to really understand how bad it is just by talking about it. It's barely even a game. The game element is just picking options like a choose your own adventure book. That's basically what it is, except it doesn't leave you to imagine the things. It tries to show them to you and fail bad. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription, so click subscribe. Don't forget to enable all notifications, and as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter, at FalconTheHero, and we'll see you next time right here on GameRanks.